don't need to argue about this. We're losing time. It yeah. might rain. <laughs> Let's talk about shock dynos today. So today's a little bit of a different video for us. You may have seen our cool race part videos where we talk about a, uh, a cool race part every day. You can find those on our shorts page. Um, we're up to over 150 of those videos, so if you like race car stuff, check those out. And we've also got our racetrack vlogs. This one's going to be almost a combination of the two. We're going to be talking about a, a shock dyno, um, a little bit how it works, a little bit how we use it, and the information that you can get from a machine like this. A little bit about this particular shock dyno. This is a Performance Trans dyno. Uh, they're based in Michigan, I think. and. Um, the shock that I'm going to be using as my example is an Owens uh, Duralite model shock. It's a double adjustable shock. This particular one's off the right rear corner. And so what we're going to do is we're going to dyno this shock, look at, look at how the dyno works, look at the graphs it produces, make some adjustments to the shock, see how it changes the force numbers, things like that. So let's get started. What does a shock dyno do for us? So a shock dyno, like an engine dyno, is a measurement tool. What we're looking for on shock absorbers is the force that it produces in compression, so when it is compressing, and in rebound when it's extending. Uh, we measure that force in pounds, and we measure it based on velocity. So the, the speed that the shaft is moving inside the shock absorber is our velocity, our shaft velocity. And we measure that in inches per second. So when we look at a shock dyno graph most of the time, what we're looking at is the force in pounds and then the velocity in inches per second. So this particular shock, I'm looking at a graph that I just ran uh, just a few minutes ago, is producing 340 pounds of rebound force at 10 inches a second. When we say rebound force, I need to clarify that that is the resistance for the shock to rebound. So compression force is the resistance for the shock to compress and rebound force is the resistance for the shock to extend. Tucker, I think this is the first good one. So uh, from here on, I'll, I think they should be okay. So let's fire this thing out. So I've got my shock mounted up. It's, it's got a clevis here and a clevis here. I set my height right here with these two bars. I'm gonna control the dyno through the laptop here. So it takes a second to bring everything up. Okay, now we're ready to go. The first thing that I get when I hit the start button is I get a, a message on the computer that says, that asks me if my hands are clear of moving parts. I'm going to confirm yes. That's a safety feature built into the dyno. When I click yes, it's now going to send a signal to the dyno to go ahead and start up. So you can see the dyno is has got an electric motor in here that's rotating and then through a scotch yoke we're taking that rotational force and turning it into a linear force. We'll talk a little bit about how a rotary dyno is a little bit different than a linear dyno a little bit later in the video. Now I can immediately see that we've got a little bit of a weeper on this particular shock so that's something that we'll have to pay attention to and look at. It's not super abnormal for a fresh shock to have some residual oil around the seals and stuff that's going to get pushed up as it gets run on the dyno. That's a little bit excessive for what I like to see, so we're going to look into that a little more uh, closely. Uh, but we've got the shock running, and so let's go ahead and hit record and run a cycle, what I would call a cycle, or a test. So this is a 10 second test. Basically it's going to run the dyno for 10 seconds and record the force and velocity over that 10 seconds through multiple cycles, multiple rotations on the motor. So behind the computer here and we're looking at the information that the uh, shock dyno has produced. This is what we call our force versus velocity graph. <clears throat> graph sorry. Here we have our compression forces. Here's the force right here, our force scale, and then here along this axis is our velocity. This is our rebound curve. So again, force, this time is shown negative, it's in the rebound, and velocity, that's measured in inches per second. Here we have a chart so we can see, and if we just look at this, we can see that at five inches per second, this shock is producing just over 100 pounds of force, and if we look at the chart, we can see it's 122.1 pounds. Same thing, we can look at five inches per second, 
on the rebound and we can see it's it's uh, it's about right between 100 and 200 and if we look over here we're producing 149.3 pounds of force at five inches a second in the rebound curve there's a few other types of uh, graph that we can get from our dyno we can get there's our force velocity we can also get a force velocity loop we can get a uh, force position and we can get a velocity versus time or a force versus time. So let's look at a couple of these. Let's start with the force versus velocity loop. Here we have, so you can see, this is a similar graph to the force versus velocity, except for this one has four lines instead of two. Well, each line is gonna to correspond to a quadrant on the dyno's rotary motion. This dyno rotates clockwise, so, here we have top dead center, so that's when the shock is fully compressed, and then as it's opening the rebound, as it's extending, it's opening the rebound stack to right here. There, it's now gonna start slowing the rebound down, so it's closing the rebound stack to bottom dead center, which is right here, and then, and then it's going to start opening the compression stack as it accelerates up to right here, okay? and then it's gonna close the compression stack up to top dead center, and then it's gonna go back into its rebound, and that would be one cycle. So on the graph, we can see here we're opening our compression, closing our compression, opening our rebound, and closing our rebound, and that's what you get when you see a force first velocity graph. A force first velocity loop graph, I guess in this case. This is a force first position graph, and you'll sometimes call this a uh, football graph. And so what we're looking at here is the force produced by the shock at different positions within the stroke. So I have this set up at a two inch stroke. So we can see there would be bottom dead center and there would be top dead center, okay? And so we're seeing the different forces produced by the shock at different places in the stroke. Uh, this would be particularly handy for uh, position sensitive shocks. A position sensitive shock is a shock that's gonna produce different amounts of either rebound or compression force at different parts of the stroke. Now if we look at the force versus time graph, this shows us all the cycles that the shock went through in its recorded time. So this dyno I have set up to record for 10 seconds. And so you can see this is how many cycles the dyno went through under that uh, 10 second recording time. What's interesting about this shock is you can see any inconsistencies the shock has. So if we've got something that appears in one cycle but doesn't appear in the next, we know there's an inconsistency to look for in the shock absorber. Okay, so now we're going to do what is probably the most common thing you look at when you look at a shock dyno, especially on an, obviously on an adjustable shock, is what the different adjustments do. So I am going to go ahead and make an adjustment to this shock right now, and then we'll test it and we'll compare it to the previous run. So right now, I measure my rebound off of how many clicks of rebound I am from full stiff. So that is when the rebound adjuster is tightened all the way down, maximum rebound, how many clicks from that position am I at? Right now I'm at 14 clicks off max rebound. I'm going to go ahead and tighten it down to four clicks off max rebound. Now we're going to run the shock again. So I've just started the recording time on this shock with my adjustments made. And so once we get finished with the cycle, we'll overlay the two graphs and we'll look at the difference between 14 clicks off of full hard on rebound to four clicks off full hard on rebound. Here we have the two graphs overlaid. We have our blue line, which is the test we just made, which was our rebound four clicks off. And then we have our green line, which was the test we made previously, which was our rebound 14 clicks off. So you can see there, there's a difference in rebound, but we also have a little difference in compression on this as well. So we can see that at five inches per second, for example, we're now producing on the rebound side about 50 pounds more of force than we were on our previous test. If we look at the compression side, we're about 20 pounds more compression force than we were at five inches a second than the previous test. Okay, so we've made a rebound 
We've made a rebound adjustment on this shock. Now we're going to make a compression adjustment and take a look at what the compression adjustment adjuster does to our force first velocity graph. So I've gone ahead and made my adjustment on my compression knob, which is right here on this remote canister. The compression, I was at 10 clicks off full hard. I'm now fully tightened down. So I've tightened the compression as far as it'll go. It should produce the most amount of force that it can with this current valving setup and this adjustment setup. I took my rebound back to 14 off, which is my standard for this shock. Okay, so we've gone ahead and started the dyno. I'm gonna start my recording cycle. So we recorded again for 10 seconds. I'm gonna go ahead and save that. While I am walking over here, don't forget to check out our, uh, our web page there. You can join our uh, Schmatreon page, get some exclusive content. And here we are. All right, so we can see that this adjustment impacted the compression, right? Uh, the green line was the compression at uh, minus 10 clicks, and the blue line was when the compression adjuster was tightened all the way down. So if we look at, let's look at six inches a second real quick because it's right there. Uh, we can see that with the adjuster tightened down, um, we're producing 176.9 pounds of force. But with it 10 clicks off, we're producing 147.1, just about 30 pounds there. These are things that you can use a shock dyno for. So when we use a shock dyno, I mostly use the force first velocity graph and I a lot of times will look at either two shocks comparing them and I can get in it to see exactly what the difference between two shocks are. We might try different viscosity oils and see the difference there. And then we might look at making adjustments on the shock and see how, A, how big the adjustment is and then set the shock where we want to start with. I generally like a shock that's set somewhere in the middle so that we have room to go either way off from our baseline setup. Uh, the other thing that we can do is look for inconsistencies. So that's where the, the football graph or the uh, uh, force first time graph really come in or, or the force first velocity loop. We can look at inconsistency in how the compression stack opens versus how it closes. Same thing on the rebound. How does the rebound stack open versus close? Um, so the shock dyno is a tool that we can use to, to really look at a number of different types of data and types of information to get a better understanding of how the shock works. Now, it is in a controlled environment, so we have to remember that, that when we test things in the shop, we're testing within a controlled environment, and so when we go to apply that information to the racetrack, we're now in a non-controlled environment where there's more variables. So that's something to think about. Whenever you make adjustments or do set up this stuff in the shop, you have to remember that the shop and the racetrack are two different places with different variables, different constraints, different temperatures, humidity. There's a whole range of different things happening at the racetrack that don't happen in a controlled environment like the shop. I hope this was helpful. I hope it made sense. I hope I made sense. This is the first one that we've done like this. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I'll, I'll do a walk around through the shop here to end the video. And we and uh, if you enjoyed this kind of stuff, check out our, our page here on YouTube. Give it a subscribe, a follow. Uh, it means a lot. Uh, you can check out our website and our Patreon page for uh, more exclusive content. We've got merch on our website now. Uh, really excited about that. Um, and make sure to follow us on the other platforms as, all, as well. We post every day here on YouTube, on TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. We post uh, uh, new content every day. So if you like racing content, uh, we'd, we'd appreciate uh, a follow, a subscribe. Okay, so here's the dyno area. I've got my toolbox for the dyno, uh, the desk that I use uh, when I'm working on the dyno. We've got our inventory of stuff here. Here's our inventory of springs. I've got my setup sticks. Here we've got our nitrogen for doing shocks. This is our shock lab, so this is where we build the shock absorbers at. This is what we call our spring smasher, so we can test our coil overloads right here. There I have a left rear off a dirt late model on it. 
This is dad's bench is what I call it. Uh, there's the carburetor off a race car and we've got the engine out right now. Uh, we run a 357 cubic inch SB2.2 uh, which puts us in super late model. Quick look at the race car. You can see the engine's out right now. Doing some work. Probably going to race in about a week and a half. So we got some work to do before we go racing. Thanks for watching. We appreciate everybody's support. See you on the next one.